every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. So welcome to the John Schultz podcast. We have Kenny Traub here, a good friend, an unbelievable business person, but just an all around great guy. Uh, very excited to have him on. Kenny has an unbelievable career. We're going to learn about that today. We're going to learn about him. He's the managing partner of Delta Value Group, managing partner of Delta Value Advisors, which is a consulting firm that specializes in public company governance and turnarounds. We need that. He's on the board of directors of Tidewater, which is a leading global operator of offshore support vessels for energy for the energy industry. Former companies that we're actually going to chat about was American Banknote Holographics and Boxware. Kenny is very smart. He's got an MBA from Harvard. I always wanted to have that, but I never got there. BA at Emory. He's part of YPO. It's called Young Presidents Organization. Obviously, Kenny and I are older now. You stay in it once you get in. So that's why we keep it uh, called that name. We love the, uh, the, 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 you know, we love YPO and everything about it. And that's how Kenny and I met. So Kenny, welcome to the podcast. John, thanks for having me. I, you're doing an amazing job of your podcast. And it's, it's really uh, my privilege and honor to be your guest today. Well, thank you. Okay. So, you know, I always state this because this is what sets the stage, you know, the myth of overnight success, but you know, a lot of what we are is formed when we're young. And, you know, we either get into good habits, bad habits, you know, we start liking things, not liking things, and it all forms as we grow up. So, you know, what did you want to be when you grew up as a kid? What was your aspirations as little Kenny? So uh, I wanted to be, um, I thought I wanted to be a doctor because my parents pushed me into being a doctor. <laughs> uh, I was very good at science in high school. Uh, and... Uh, since I was good at it, I kept going. I was pre-med at Emory. Uh, I uh, had a 4.0 average on all the pre-med courses, uh, chemistry, biology, physics. I um, was set to be able to get into the medical school of my choice. And that was exactly my father's aspiration for me. Uh, by uh, late in my junior year of college, after completing the pre-med curriculum, I volunteered in hospitals and I realized I actually didn't like working in a hospital. So I uh, uh, had to do some soul searching and I realized, you know what, I, uh, I like being creative. I like doing things my own way. Medicine is not the kind of profession where you really can do things your own way. So I had to make the difficult call to my dad and I said, dad, I don't want to be a doctor. Uh, he said, what are you talking about? Uh, what do you, uh, that's what the plan was. So I said, well, I said, tell you what, dad, uh, how about I'll go to law school? Uh, and uh, so I take the LSATs, I apply to law schools, I get into some Ivy League law schools, and I decide I don't want to be a lawyer. Uh, so I, I make the next difficult call to my dad and say, uh, dad, I don't think I want to be a lawyer. Uh, so what are you going to do now? Trust me, I'll go into business. What do you know about business? You were pre-med. You didn't uh, hardly take any business courses in college. What do you What do you know about businesses? Trust me, I'll get a job. I go through um, uh, recruiting. I get a job at Merrill Lynch in investment banking. I'm at Merrill Lynch for exactly two weeks when a friend of mine calls and said, I just rented a Winnebago. We're heading cross country. I have one open spot. You in or you out? I gave Merrill Lynch two weeks notice. Uh, so, uh, and the, the reason why- Sounds like I, a Seinfeld episode, man. This, this, uh, so, and then I traveled uh, and I really needed that period of time to find myself. Uh, and, you know, there were some lessons learned from that experience. First, uh, just because you're good at something doesn't mean it's the right thing. Uh, I was good at science, but it really wasn't the right direction for me to uh, go to med school. Uh, and you certainly shouldn't do something because it's somebody else's aspiration. Uh, and uh, so 
Uh, and the third thing I learned is there's a time and a place for everything. And I, I will not trade that experience I had of traveling around the country and finding myself uh, for anything. Uh, so that was a great experience. It took me some time. Then I, uh, once I got back, I said, all right, well, now I got to make something of myself. Uh, and I already rejected uh, medicine, uh, law school. I doubt another investment bank's going to hire me after I just uh, quit after two weeks. So I uh, went to a more entrepreneurial company called Johnstown American. I uh, took the first job I could get at $12,000 a year. Uh, and uh, it was a very diversified, actually, real estate company, John. Uh, so your yeah. world. Uh, yeah. And I... Uh, uh, started in market research and the CEO of the company noticed me and he said, you know what? I want to find an assistant that I'm going to bring around the company. And he gave me unbelievable experiences from uh, acquisitions to uh, syndications. I took a role in the mortgage department and property management. And I learned a lot about the business. Uh, I was there for three years. He agreed to some uh, to uh, pay for a portion of business school, so I applied to business school. I get into Harvard, uh, and uh, in 1986, uh, uh, with a commitment that I will uh, come back the summer in between years of business school, and then uh, for at least two years afterwards, I uh, go to business school. I come back that summer, and then, as you probably recall, in 1986, the tax laws changed, and a lot of their business got crushed. Johnstown went bankrupt in 1987, uh, and uh, there was no job for me to come back to. I was relieved of my commitment. And uh, unlike a lot of my peers at Harvard Business School who had already went through recruiting, and I, I thought I had a job. So I needed to find something different. And that actually worked to my favor because I it is my... Um, it's the way I operate that I would much rather do something more entrepreneurial and not a typical MBA job. So I find this company called Trans Resources, which uh, was a, a multinational holding company that uh, bought businesses in uh, primarily in the chemical industry, but in many different businesses. Uh, and I was hired as assistant to the chairman uh, to drive acquisitions. And then after doing that for a while, he said, you know what, what I think you would really be better at is helping us fix the businesses that uh, we've acquired. So he sent me into several of the portfolio companies. And that's where I cut my teeth in uh, operations management and, and in particular turnarounds. So what I love about that is nothing was planned. It was just sort of, and it's, I don't call it, you can call it happenstance, but it's not, it's, you, you you believed in yourself, right? You you know the the greatest lesson I heard so far is that you know and, and, and it seems like a theme for most people is you you know we think we have to do something because we have to please someone else whether it's our parents or whoever it is, and we end up in things that we're good at but not really necessarily what was our purpose or our plan for for the world and you you sort of let that go and. Yeah, you, you found some really interesting things. So let's talk about, you know, what's this Voxware thing, you know, like, how did that come about? You know, what did it teach you? You know, it evolved into this whole big, you know, thing that you went through that really did shape your life as well. So why don't you give everybody a little background on Voxware? Sure. So Voxware um, started off as a hobby. While I had this job, I really liked at Trans Resources. Uh, and uh, a young engineer came to me for career advice. He was working on uh, technology and speech compression in 1994. And he said, you know what? I'm working on this technology, uh, uh, but I need a job. Uh, you have any contacts at a place like um, Bell Labs or where I could go? And I said, tell me a little bit more about this technology. Uh, and uh, we decided to form a company around uh, his technology for speech compression. The original idea was to store speech in capacity constrained environments. So the first uh, was digital answering machines. Then it was CD-ROMs for um, uh, 
books on, uh, on CD-ROMs at the time. Uh, and uh, so that's how we started the company. But uh, as we progressed, uh, we started to think, wow, this, this idea of compressing, digitizing and then compressing speech, is this the kind of thing that could be used to talk over this new phenomenon in 1994 called the internet? Uh, and we became one of the first companies uh, in the world to uh, do uh, internet telephony in a big way. Uh, so, uh, and at that time it was computer to computer talking uh, like we're doing now, but yeah. at that time it was ba very bandwidth constrained. So we wanted to establish a standard for voice over IP. And uh, it became a hot idea. I got uh, Intel as a financial backer. I got other uh, venture capital firms. And we really wanted to get the major software platforms to adopt us as a standard. So I uh, was uh, very close to uh, negotiating a partnership with Microsoft, when at the same time, I was negotiating with Netscape. And both companies said, you know what, the only one we care about is the other. And Microsoft was pushing hard to do a deal with them. And, uh, and uh, I decided at that time, and this was one of the biggest strategic mistakes I've made in my career, I decided to leave Microsoft at the altar and do an exclusive partnership with Netscape. Oh, uh, oh God. That, um, so uh, if uh, anyone's not familiar with Netscape at the time, they were the hottest company. They were dominating the internet. They had an 85% share of the browser market Microsoft was just trying to break in, uh, but they dominated the desktop. So, uh, and ultimately Microsoft was sued by the Justice Department for putting Netscape and others out of business uh, by effectively bundling the Netscape, uh, the equivalent of the Netscape browser. But after signing the Netscape deal, I signed literally hundreds of uh, license agreements with every software company that wanted to interoperate with Netscape Navigator. IBM, Oracle, Apple, and all the others. Uh, and we, we were front page of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, the Forbes Fortune Business Week wrote us up. We had a very hot IPO uh, and it was very exciting until Microsoft came uh, and decided they, you know, we, Netscape was a threat, we were a threat and they crushed our business model. Uh, so uh, we went from being super hot to uh, being crushed by Microsoft. So, uh, okay. anyway, so and it just shows you, right? Like every decision matters. Like, 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 and but your decision look right, but it just, you know, all these extenuating circumstances make things, you know, most of the time uncertain, even though we think they're certain, right? So it's interesting. Well, and I'm not going to be the first person uh, to say this, and certainly not the last. You learn more from your mistakes than your accidental successes. Uh, so uh, we did some things right with Voxware. We were ahead of our time, um, but we made some mistakes uh, and paid the price. So I, um, now I was a founder of Voxware. I had founder shares. At that point, I made more money on those founder shares than I ever had in my life. So in that respect, uh, it was a success, but it was far from my aspirations. So um, I left uh, Voxware in the summer of 1998. Uh, sold my stock. Went looking for something different. Uh, so we're so we're so okay. So here you are. You thought you had this thing. It blew up. You know, how did your brain feel? Like like what what drove you to want to do something maybe more entrepreneurial again or not entrepreneurial? How, how did you fight through it? Because you know. I always look at failure as something that teaches me and actually it's pivoting me to where I'm supposed to be. You know, how did you go through that? Uh, at first it, it, it hit me hard. Uh, it was, uh, there was a lot of finger pointing. There was uh, a lot of um, just disappointment. It was very emotional. Uh, it, we had really high aspirations to change the world with Voxware. We really thought we were taking on the entire communications industry. And uh, we we were on our way with our Netscape deal. Uh, we did not anticipate how um, Microsoft would um, be so aggressive in crushing the model. And then look, we made some other mistakes too, but 
the um, it, so it was hard at first. It took me a few months to get over my wounded ego and uh, and just be determined to you know find something better and a different fit for me. Uh, so I went looking for something different. Uh, I was a player in the internet. We were one of the first hot internet oriented companies. Uh, so I was tempted to do another internet deal, but decided, you know what? It's too unpredictable. I don't know who Microsoft is going to crush next. I'd rather find a business that is uh, more stable, more understanding, more predictable. Uh, so I find a company that is effectively the polar opposite of Voxware, and that's uh, American Banknote. Voxware, I started in my studio apartment in New York City with this young engineer. Uh, American Banknote was started in 1795. It was the original print of American currency. Uh, unlike me and my- I mean, a little, little extreme, I mean, talk about extremes, right? <laughs> I mean, that's like, that's not like a little different, Kenny. That's like extremely the opposite. Correct. So, you know, unlike me and you know, my little buddies that started Vox, where Paul Revere and other American patriots <laughs> organized American banking. Uh, the, uh, so, and, you know, way back in 1795, uh, the you know, people knew that they needed a uh, secure banknote or currency, uh, and uh, American banknote became the leading printer of, of currency for the the new United States. Yep. Uh, and um, so uh, in uh, shortly after I left Voxware, American Banknote, which was a New York Stock Exchange company, uh, did, uh, did a spinoff on the New York Stock Exchange and split into two different businesses. Uh, and uh, when they did that, they promised the investment bankers and their auditors that shortly uh, following the IPO spinoff, they will hire a new chief financial officer for the spun off entity. Uh, I applied for that job and got it uh, and became executive VP and CFO of the newly uh, public company called American Banknote Holographics, uh, which uh, was uh, oriented towards providing the next generation anti counterfeiting features for documents and products. Uh, now it's way past uh, printing currency. The United States started printing its own currency in the 1860s, but many other countries around the world uh, outsourced currency printing, and we're looking for secure features. And American Banknote Holographics provided the secure features such as holograms and other devices for currency, for credit cards, for packaging like pharmaceuticals, consumer products, et cetera. So it seemed like, it, uh, uh, first of all, a much more understandable business and a business that appealed to me because I saw, you know what, counterfeiting isn't going away. It's a big problem. If it exists, if there was a need to have secure printing in 1795, it's a lot bigger need today with uh, better tools and counterfeiters uh, disposal. So I accept the job uh, and uh, the my very first day of work, I meet with uh, company management I meet with Deloitte and Touche, the company's auditors, and I am certain after one day that the last two quarter SEC filings, uh, there are 10 Qs that they filed with the SEC, have uh, errors. Uh, I, uh, so I tell my boss, who's the president, tell my boss's boss, the chairman CEO, you've got a problem here, and I cannot be the CFO of the company till you uh, correct the problem. Uh, so uh, they. All right, so here you are, right? Yeah, go Growing into chaos. You thought you were going to pick this stable, long-time concern, and you're thrown into chaos. And obviously, there was issues that you know, you know, this became a case study at Harvard. But that's what happened. My thing for you and for people, when you, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs? When you're thrown into something that is chaos, that is a long, you know, process to get through it, you know, what should they think about when they're facing it? Like, like, what does crisis do? Uh, what did it, what did it do to you as a person? How did you flow through the issues? So, uh, let, let let me give you some background on how um, how extreme these issues were. So okay. when when I. Um, uh, I found the problem. I, I 
uh, they scheduled a board meeting at which I quit, said I cannot be the CFO unless you disclose the issue to the public. Uh, they uh, retain investigators. They uh, discover that the problem is much deeper and then all hell broke loose. Uh, in the midst of that, they come back to me and said, can you help us at first as a consultant? Uh, and I agree to do that in an unofficial capacity. The stock declined on the New York Stock Exchange from over $18 to 52 cents. Yeah. The SEC commenced an investigation. There were lawsuits everywhere. The business of the company was to produce security products to prevent fraud. And now it's being accused of a massive fraud. Customers are canceling contracts. Suppliers are cutting them off. Uh, employees are quitting. Now, in the midst of this scandal, after I'm a consultant, they come back to me and say, uh, here's what we've decided to do. We're going to fire the president. We'd like to offer you the job of president, reporting to the chairman and CEO. I accept that job in the midst of this enormous scandal. Uh, and But what makes you do that? Because that, that, like, I know there's the story, but what like what makes you run into the fire, right? Is that your personality? You know, is that your, I mean, you went to law school, you're good at science, you know, you, 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 you sort of figured out your, how did you figure, figure that that's something you wanted to do? Uh, because, you know, what I learned about myself is I love solving problems and I've okay. always loved solving problems. Uh, so, uh, and you know, when I, uh, when, um, looking for something different from Voxware. And, you know, I thought I wanted something more stable and predictable. And that's why I went to American Bank. Nope. nope. Really what I like is finding issues that I can solve. And I believed that this business was savable, but there was, there were things that needed to be done to save it. So uh, when I, I, ultimately they offered me the job of president, the number two person reporting to the chairman and CEO, uh, after I accept that job, I learn that I now believe that my new boss, the chairman and CEO, directed and perpetrated the fraud. And I uh, and so that it was more serious than I had ever imagined. I present my findings to the independent directors and they're loyal to him. Uh, there was essentially one credential for board membership at this New York Stock Exchange company. So I fight with the board and ultimately with the support of Chase, the company's lead banker, I force every director to resign and I become the CEO of the company and rebuilt the board. Uh, so now getting back to you know, the answer to your question of how did I save the company in the midst of this enormous scandal and chaos? The walls were caving in, they had no cash. Chase declared a default on the debt. Customers were leaving. So there was only one solution, and that was to win trust back from all of the key constituents uh, because they blew it. This, it, it. A company that commits fraud pro, may not survive no matter what industry they're in. Uh, you know, Look at Enron, WorldCom, right? But if your business is fraud prevention, your chances aren't good. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, but what I needed to do is earn the trust of every key constituent, the company's creditors, the uh, customers, the employees. Uh, and ultimately I did. Uh, they, and they recognized that, yeah, mistakes were made in the past. That's former management. I replaced, uh, when I became CEO, I fired every member of the management team and became the only officer of, uh, of the company. I replaced the entire board. And, uh, the, and that, that's part of how I won trust back. Now, in the midst of doing that, uh, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the stock declined to 52 cents. A group of shareholders uh, filed the 13D and then a proxy state. And they said, you know what, Trout, we like what you're doing. Right. You you really you you rolled your sleeves up. You you are responsible for saving the company. We respect that. But what we don't like is that you handpicked every member of the board. Uh, and that's not right. You're supposed to report to the board. They're supposed to be independent. 
Uh, and my first reaction when I heard them say that is, how dare they? Look what I'm doing to save the company. But then I realized, you know what? They actually have a point. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, uh, and I started to study a little bit more about corporate governance. Uh, and, you know, the failure of this business was, was a failure of governance in an extreme way. And, you know, management uh, uh, committed fraud. The Justice Department convicted my predecessor of fraud uh, and uh, the board did not oversee them. But the, uh, uh, now I, I would never make those kinds of mistakes, but when I rebuilt the board, was it right that I would handpick every director that I would report to? Uh, and uh, so they were right. And I agreed to settle uh, with uh, the shareholders and uh, brought two of uh, their nominees onto the board, which were really helpful in uh, further executing the turnaround that ultimately we sold the company. So what was the hardest? I mean, you seem very decisive. And what I'm learning is like in crisis, you got to be decisive quickly, right? Is that one of the things you feel is the superpower in you that you're not afraid to make a decision that, you, you know, like what's your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, uh, what you said is correct, being decisive, but I, I'm i not going to put that as number one. I, I think number one is having a North Star, uh, having something that you really believe in. Uh, in this instance, and I think it applies in every instance, uh, my North Star is uh, centered on integrity, winning trust from everyone I deal with, uh, when, when Harvard teaches a case study about what I just described in American Bank, at the end of that case study, uh, uh, the, the parting message is you've probably heard in business that cash is king. I say, don't believe it. Can't you can make cash, you can lose cash, you can raise cash back. Uh, cash is fungible. What is not is your integrity. And the most important ingredient to uh, building a sustainable and successful business is your integrity and winning trust from everyone you deal with. And so is that, is that how you measure success for you on, you know, what people, cause you know, your business is interesting, right? Like it seems like because you love fixing problems, once they're done, it's time to move on. Right. Which means, to feel what success is for you would have to be a multiple of different companies and where you, you know, ended with them. Would you feel, and you feel that's the entire modus operandi is like trust customers, people that work with you. Uh, first of all, it's, it, it's what makes me feel good about myself, uh, that acting with integrity. Uh, and if people trust you, they're going to want to work with you. Uh, so, and that, you know, in the midst of, you know, the walls closing in on that business, which is a great case study, it's the only way to save it is to get everyone you deal with to say, um, I believe you, despite the past, uh, I'm willing to work with you. And the easiest thing in the world in American Banknote is for the customers to say, uh, you committed fraud. I got to work with somebody else. Right. Uh, and, uh, so, and that's, that's what informed me as I moved on. So when I sold uh, American Banknote Holographics, uh, I took away some insights, right? A lot of it was about governance, that there, there are issues in public company governance when, uh, you know, particularly when you've got too close a relationship between management and boards and boards that are supposed to oversee management and be accountable to shareholders. Uh, so uh, in private companies, you don't generally have that issue, right? When you, uh, the owner of a private business uh, picks their own management or manages the business himself, and there's a close alignment of interest between management and owners. Public companies, ownership is diffuse, and if the board is not um, doing its role of overseeing management, shareholders could suffer. Uh, so I decided after selling American Backnote Holographics to look for undervalued public companies that were undervalued for reasons that I thought were fixable and to bring my 
background and experience and turnarounds, and in frankly, building trust uh, to uh, help execute turnarounds of public companies. So, but so a question, and this is like, you're always in an, how do you learn to live with such uncertainty all the time? I mean, I, I get it. You want to fix problems. We all want to fix problems, but what kind of mindset do you have to have that allows you to mm -hmm. always go in a situation that's difficult, that undervalued, things going wrong, chaos, crisis, like what kind of, kind of mindset do you have to develop? Oh, you just got to, you know, love the process, John. Uh, I, I've gotten involved in companies in every industry. I've, but to define that, Kenny, what does the process mean for real? Because like everyone says that, you know, I, I just had on, he's awesome. You know, the founder of Waze, co-founder of Waze. He has a new book, Fall in Love with the Problem, Not the Solution. Mm -hmm. It just seems like anyone that excels in like uncertainty has this thing but they like the problem, but like no one ever explains what is the process to fall. Like, how do you fall in love with that process? It's, it's it's energizing to me. The reason why I like to get involved in troubled companies is because that that's that's what's uh, energizing me to figure out what are the key drivers. Uh, the you know other people are you know driven in other areas, it's fine. I love to solve problems. I love to find the company where there is this function and I can identify that what's causing it to underperform and push the right buttons. It's, uh, and you know, the, doing it in public companies, it's a combination of um, business and social dynamic. Or businesses are, organizations of people. Uh, so I love the process of working with people that often, you know, if the business is underperforming uh, and you come to them and say, you know, I have an idea of what you, sh uh, the reason why you're underperforming, and what you should do, do differently. Human nature is most people, most managers or boards of public companies don't want to hear it. Uh, they don't want to be told that, uh, you know, you know better than me when I'm they have their own North Star that, you know, that like like you said, they have their North Star. Right. So what I love about that process is the dynamic of getting people to under uh, to accept that there is a different way of looking at things and accept uh, and build a consensus around a new idea that solves the reason why the company's underperforming and drives value. Uh, when I when I sold American Bank, I had money to invest and I decided to be um, a value investor. Uh, and then I had an insight on value investing that, you know, well, I'll, there's a lot of very successful value investors in the world. Great. But there's a reason why okay, if a company is trading at a discount to its intrinsic value, it's usually not an accident. Right there, there's going to be reasons why it's trading at a discount to its intrinsic value. Uh, there are reasons why investors don't like what's going on. If you can identify those reasons and fix them, you can add value. But then you have to not you can't just come up with the idea. You have to then come up with the idea and convince a board and management that your idea is better than the status quo, uh, and that that involves overcoming a resistance because it's human nature to say, you know, uh, what I'm doing is just fine. I don't need your help. Well, it's also, you know, you have, you're teaching people listening to this, that having a real view, being able to look at things a different way, right? Like you and I could be looking down the street. I'm going to see blue. You're going to see red. We're all looking at things the way we're projecting our own stuff on it. Right. So like, and that's another, be open, like be open to hear people's views. That doesn't mean you have to take everyone. So I think if you're either an entrepreneur, a CEO, or you could be running your house, whatever you do, I think uh, the magic words that I just heard out of your mouth is getting people to look at things a different way is what's going to drive every product, society, and, and us at large. And uh, 
you seem to uh, have mastered that to a certain degree, my friend. Well, I, I you you got it, John. Uh, it's it's also treating people with respect. Uh, so yep. uh, if um, you know a business is un underperforming, people don't want to just hear that you know you're you're no good at what you do. Uh, they, uh, it, but it's about building a rapport with people to understand you know why they are where they are and have them trust you to help bring them to another level. Uh, and that's why I, you know, I've really enjoyed getting involved in businesses in so many different industries where you know, I can come down a learning curve on semiconductors, biotech, software, manufacturing, retail, energy. Uh, and, uh, but I love learning new industries, but it's what I really love is the process. Uh, the process of, identifying the problem and building a consensus through building a trust and rapport on executing new ideas. It's funny. Listen, I don't think I would enjoy the process that you love, which is the process, which is being in chaos and crisis. That's just not how I'm built. But I know in what I do, most of the fun, it's not like you close a deal. You're like, all right, I just close. But it was all the process of getting there. It was the people you met. It was the buy-in you had to get from all the different parties. It was the creative ideas that actually looked at that property or whatever it was as an investment a different way. And like, if, if you fall in love with that process, just like you said, I think that's what makes your life fun and business fun and your personal life fun, whatever that process is. You know, Kenny, I want to, you know, great nuggets here. I want to I thank you so much for being on this podcast. Uh, I know you're busy. You know, uh, there's lots of companies out there that, you know, I'm, I'm sure are going to be uh, wanting someone like Kenny to be aligned with them. Because at the end of the day, teaching people how to look at things a different way is one of the, the most important things on, I think, from breakthroughs to creations to inventions, right? Someone just thought about it a different way. And to master that is just incredible. H how can people find you? You know, companies, lots of people listen to this podcast uh in business you have a website for yourself like how do, how can we find kenny yeah so my companies are delta value group uh which is a, an investment firm delta value advisors uh which is a consulting firm both focused on uh, um corporate turnarounds public companies and uh and do you have a website uh, for that or are you, are you just yeah. on linkedin okay so delta value group.com or correct okay well, Kenny, this was amazing. Good luck. Uh, you know, with interest rates going the way they're, where they're going now, I'm sure there's going to be lots of restructuring and issues that we all have to deal with. We're in a whole different monetary cycle, right, than we're used to for the last 12 years. But uh, good luck. And again, thanks for being here. John, it's really a pleasure. Thank you for having me.